to see if there will be more people who will join. Okay, I think we can, I, I will start slowly with the introduction. So anyone who wants uh, to, to join later, no problem. And also this um, video, if you cannot, uh, if you cannot follow the, the entire two, two classes, uh, you can see it later on, on YouTube. Uh, so um, welcome, uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Natasha Sharkic. I am founder of AITA Archaeology. We are a company that is based in um, in Barcelona, but as you will see, we are collaborating with experts worldwide, and uh, we are also dedicating to organizing field schools and um, live online courses. Um, so you can see some of them right now. And today, I have really great pleasure to uh, to invite to two of uh, our. Uh, our collaborators and uh, members of ETA by archaeology, who will give some really interesting talk on um, archaeozoology and archaeobotany. And this is extremely important because uh, bioarchaeology is not just about humans, human bones and human remains, but it's uh, everything, uh, all the other you know, like, uh, living beings are also making, making important parts of it. And Fortunately, this uh, consciousness about this is slowly changing, but I think that we we have to talk more about that and uh, we have to to listen to our and collaborate for with other experts. And in this way, we can really get the most of every dig. So uh, it will be really nice to, to uh, it's really nice to, to hear them and also to uh, hear how can we make our digs better, how to collect samples in the best possible way, and in general, how our collaboration can uh, go to another level. So I would also have like to, to mention that we will have an uh, introduction to archaeozoology uh, in, uh, in April. So if you like, um, if you like this, this introduction, maybe you would be interesting to check our website and, and see more about that and see the program. So uh, I, will, I will just make a little introduction and then I will leaving the words and the microphone to, to Dimitria. So today's speakers will be Dimitri Markovic, who uh, is a, a PhD candidate from the in, from uh, Bioarchaeology Laboratory in the Faculty of Belgrade. And uh, the second speaker would be Anna Smook. She is doing her PhD in Groningen in Netherlands. So you can also, Dimitria, you can introduce yourself a little bit and I'm leaving the microphone to you. Okay, thank you very much. First of all, hello uh, hello again from, from myself. And like Natasha said, uh, I'm an archaeologist. I'm currently doing my PhD studies uh, at the Faculty of Philosophy in the, in Belgrade, and I am uh, currently studying um, Roman animal remains from the like a Roman castrum, a Roman legion, a legion, uh, Roman fort on the Danube. Uh, but I'm also a part of one project that I will actually talk about um, during the presentation, so you'll hear about it. If you can just uh, stop sharing this uh, the the poster, so I can share the presentation. Yeah. Just another no, uh, another remark. Uh, you can ask after the, the first uh, lecture. You can ask uh, Dimitri everything you want, or you can write email if you want to watch this later on. Yeah, 
Okay, so thank you again. Uh, this lecture is titled Introduction to Archaeozoology, and it would be exactly like the title sa says. So it would be a lot of stuff uh, uh, in a short period of time. I have uh, uh, many slides, and I, I hope that I won't bore you to death uh, with everything I have to say. Um, so first, that just to clear uh, uh, what the structure of the presentation will be, so you can uh, follow it uh, uh, better, basically. The first part will be just an actual introduction to archaeozoology, to um, studying of animal bones is ge in general, where, where do we find them, uh, how did uh, archaeozoology actually come about, um, how it start, where it started from and where it is now. Uh, then I will talk shortly about the excavation process and the primary analysis of animal remains. Uh, and finally, I will give you a couple of examples just to so you can see basically how archaeozoology is implemented into modern um, archaeological um, archaeological work or research so uh, what is archaeozoology as as the word itself says i think that you can all, all uh, uh, guess what archaeozoology is it's basically a study of animal remains from archaeological sites uh, what is important here is for you to understand that uh, even though uh, we study animal remains from the archaeological sites, our main goal is to understand uh, the humans and human behavior. So animal uh, remains are just a tool for us, uh, like uh, some other archaeologists work with, I don't know, coins, Roman coins or whatever, ceramics, uh, different kinds of materials. It's just a tool for us to better understand uh, what life looked like, uh, I don't know, hundreds, thousands, uh, uh, tens of thousands or millions year, millions a uh, year ago, basically. So uh, it all started basically, it, you can trace it back to the end of the 18th or uh, mainly 19th century when, uh, when animal bones were first recognized or found on um, excavations and people back then archaeologists back then didn't really pay much much attention to them uh, in terms of the things they could learn from animal remains but they were actually used uh, mainly in as help in dividing uh, the fat the past so for example we had um, so-called woolly mammoth periods or rhinoceros periods is period uh, etc which actually was determined when some human remains were found next to uh, animal remains when they uh, uh, when they determined which animals uh, those remains were from they could say okay this uh, person or this these people lived in the period of the woolly mammal so this is called uh, the woolly mammal period uh, up until the maybe first half of the 20th century, animal remains from the archaeological sites, which start being collected more often, were usually just sporadically analyzed by mostly biologists or even paleontologists. And uh, the goal was just to determine their taxon, so their species, basically, to say, okay, we have 15, whatever, cattle remains, we have seven, uh, uh, I don't know, pig remains or whatever, and these uh, analyses were just put uh, as an uh, appendix, basically, at the end of some uh, huge archaeological research, just as a statistical reminder for us to see uh, what animals were present. Uh, as time went by, we came to the middle, mid-20th mid century or 50-something, uh, 50 60 years uh, into the 20th century when new archaeology um, emerges. So when archaeologists mainly from the Anglo-Saxon um, areas of the world decided to say that, okay, this the stuff you're doing right now isn't really archaeology. You're just, I don't know, collecting some, you're fetishizing over some archaeological remains. Um, you aren't really scientists. So they uh, wanted more science and more anthropology um, in the archaeology itself, meaning that they wanted to implement much more of the uh, what would be known as hard sciences into the 
field itself, as well as to uh, put the human uh, into the center of the research, uh, rather than, for example, ceramic vessels, which ceramic uh, pot was the most beautiful or whatever. Uh, quickly, bioarchaeology followed, um, and it meant that we had a larger amount of uh, biological, chemical, or, phys or uh, uh, physics perspectives into the archaeology when uh, animal remains, plant remains, and also human remains uh, gained basically new importance and were treated uh, differently. For example, in Serbia, we are still, we're, we're just uh, uh, getting, I think, to that, to that part where uh, older generations of archaeologists start, start to understand are just starting to understand the importance of animal remains and to understand what new information, new insights uh, they can get uh, from those uh, analyses. Uh, 21st century brought us new uh, new paradigms, paradigms, new shifts. Um, we started to contextualize uh, animal remains in more advanced and more uh, uh, in, in a way that is more like hu rather humanities than uh, just hard science in in uh, English language. And for example, one one of the first uh, publications that was dealing with this was Nerissa Russell's Social Archaeozoology, where uh, animal remains weren't only looked as a part of the economy, but rather uh, we understood that they. Uh, were implemented in all of the aspects of human life. Uh, so basically we can learn about whatever rituals and other stuff that represented one one culture. So we're somewhere between these uh, 20 and 21st century right now. We have uh, large groups of archaeozoologists that are now becoming more and more uh, um, interested in uh, contextualizing their work. Uh, since archaeology is pretty, let's say, young discipline, so some somewhere uh, since the seventies, for example, we we tend to uh, tend to think that uh, it started. Basically, we're still not sure about the name itself. So we have both zoo archaeology and archaeologically ar archaeozoology used equally um, in the research, and this is evident. For example, we have. Uh, an International Council of Archaeozoology, and one of the affiliated groups of the International Council, Council is this um, Postgraduate Zoo Archaeology uh, Forum. And also, zoo archaeology is mainly, is usually used in the Anglo-Saxon Anglo world, so mainly in the US, while uh, the rest of the world uh, uses archaeozoology in, in uh, more, basically. Uh, in my if anybody uh, asks me, it's not that anybody did ask me, but my opinion is that archaeology is a better, uh, better name because uh, archaeologists and different uh, uh, people tend to generalize us and to say that we're not archaeologists actually, that we're just there to give uh, zoo archaeology reports. And I think that we are first and foremost archaeologists because we look into the we are dealing with the human past and just our like I said our tool our animal remains so the first part being archaeo I think is a better version for me so where can we find uh, animals basically everywhere and what is important to say is that archaeozoology doesn't deal with animal bones uh, just with the animal bones but rather with everything that concerns uh, animals so we can have uh, animal bones as part of the archaeological la layer alongside different material. We can also have whole animals as part of uh, individual graves or graves alongside human remains, but we can also have some uh, iconography representations of animals, which we also try to uh, try to analyze. And so archaeologists basically uh, analyze those stuff, uh, this stuff too. Uh, I'll just quickly go through some major themes in archaeology just to show you the diversity of questions we can ask. Uh, obviously, there are many, many, many themes uh, and every basically period has its own um, major themes. But for example, for me, it would be 
first and foremost, economic uh, economic issues, such as the diet or husbandry practices to see how past societies, uh, what did they eat? How did they manage uh, their animals? Uh, did they have some surpluses or whatever? Uh, then we can talk about ritual practices. I'm actually going to give you one example from Serbia uh, later on. Uh, different types of, for example, sacrifices of uh, of parts that animals uh, took into different societies. Uh, conservation management, both in terms of past conservation, wildlife, for example, or uh, today's. I'm also going to give uh, uh, one example about this later on. And obviously domestication. So one of the one of the most important pro processes in, in human basically history when we started domesticating wild animals for uh, domestic ones. Uh, now I'm just going to I'm going to uh, talk about some more practical stuff. So I'm gonna uh, uh, talk to you about how to retrieve final remains, how to what is our uh, uh, the best post excavation process, and what can we do with primary analysis. Uh, I'm. I decided to talk about this because I thought that uh, no, maybe not all of you are that interested in archaeology in terms of becoming archaeologists or working with animal remains, etc. But I thought that you, as probably uh, many of you are archaeologists, uh, deal with animal remains on daily basis on excavations. And I thought that it could be important for you to see uh, what you should pay attention to and how to preserve the uh, archaeological uh, remains the best basically so obviously the first part and uh, uh, we get the most of uh, animal remains by excavating the archaeological sites and animal bones usually comprise second most common uh, material found on archaeological sites after uh, the ceramic material except for the uh, paleolithic sites where animal remains are the most common um, item found. So they're usually, uh, uh, we have high numbers such as hundreds or even thousands of animal remains uh, coming from one, one excavation. So when you, uh, uh, the usual way of excavating is hand ex excavation, like we can see on this uh, image and the animal bones that we can excavate by hand are usually slightly um, a larger, uh, for example, larger or uh, mid-large, uh, semi-large domestic animals such as cattle, pigs, goats, sheep, etc. And those remains look basically like this. So not everything can be found uh, while excavating just the hand. So depending on your uh, research questions, depending on the soil you're, you're uh, digging in, and also depending on your time and money, obviously, uh, we have different methods to get as much as animal as much animal remains as possible. So there's sifting, where we can find smaller animals such as fish or uh, different birds that can usually uh, end up missing, or even with flotation, which Anna will talk uh, uh, probably about, when we can find even smaller remains such as insects or um, rodents. Now, like I said. Uh, different research questions uh, guide your uh, decisions on what type of excavation uh, you're going to uh, um, you're going to do or what type of retrieving. So, for example, if you're just looking at uh, uh, husbandry practices of some I don't know small settlement or enclosure, uh, insects or rodent bones aren't. Uh, as important to you as are for someone who is dealing with, for example, uh, diseases or microbes or stuff like that. So it's not necessary. And for example, in Serbia, we don't always have neither time nor money to flotate or sift uh, uh, our, our basically dirt. So uh, we try to excavate as slowly as possible so you can see basically everything and collect everything. And also it's a mistake to only collect uh, larger fragments or fragments that are uh, good looking, for example, I don't know how to phrase that, uh, but you should collect everything that you find because a lot of that can be can be determined. So when excavating, uh, unlike 
different types of archaeological materials, such as ceramic vessels, such as glass, I don't know, such as uh, coins or, or stuff like that, that can be dated uh, even while excavating. Animal remains aren't uh, basically datable, let's say. Even uh, that's a strange phrase, but basically you can't date them. Um, pig remains from the Roman period look exactly like pig remains from the medieval, for example, period. Uh, so it's very important to follow the vertical and horizontal contexts uh, while you're excavating. This is just one example of our archaeological stratigraphy where different, for example, pits um, enter different uh, uh, um, periods, let's say, that were earlier on. So animal remains from uh, different contexts should be collected, uh, collected together. This is also important because um, animal remains are usually so rarely do we find whole animals they're usually just uh, parts of the animals that ended up from for example butchery or from some uh, dining uh, occasions and ended up in the trash so uh, one animal can be scattered around basically uh, on your horizontal horizontal context and you can try to feed them um, while an, an, on your analysis uh, later on. Also, there can be intentional groupings of animal remains, which are pretty important for your whole context of the site. Uh, I'm going to talk later about this example from the, from the picture. And intentional groupings of animal remains usually come alongside different uh, materials. So it's very important to pay attention to uh, the whole site and not just uh, if you're, I don't know, working with ceramics, you just pay attention to ceramics or, or I don't know, stone tools or whatever. Uh, so you must look into everything. Animal remains uh, that usually end up with some ceramic vessels or metal objects, knives, etc., can be an interesting uh, context that doesn't necessarily mean that it's just a, a butchery waste, for example. And finally, every now and then we can have whole skeletons. Uh, for example, this is a skeleton of uh, a camel from Viminatium, from Serbia, from a Roman site, from a Roman period site. Uh, and what's important when excavating, when you stumble upon such an, uh, such an, uh, such a skeleton, uh, you should try to excavate as much as possible of it. So uh, you shouldn't take it apart and just take uh, uh, um, different bones. You should wait until you. Uh, excavate the whole skeleton and then take it up as a as a whole animal and also analyze it um, as such. Uh, like I said, uh, there was actually a, an experiment uh, done a couple of years ago where they put uh, a horse carcass on a field and just wanted to see uh, what will happen with it uh, in, in the following period. So in just a couple of days, uh, the most part of the carcass was actually scattered around, all around. So there was uh, skin to the, there were limbs and vertebrae on one side, there were heads and, I don't know, uh, scapular and whatever were on the other side. And this was an important experiment, experiment because it showed us that uh, when we excavate just on a one horizontal line, uh, like I said, the different elements of different bones from the same individuals, same animals can be scattered all around. Uh, this is another example. This is also, also these are two car carcasses that are also scattered all around. So it's uh, quite different to, for example, forensic anthropology, physical anthropology, where you're usually dealing with a whole skeleton, uh, for example, from some graves or whatever. Um, when it comes to archaeozoology, you're most uh, you're mostly dealing with just sporadic uh, elements of different animals and. Archaeology is also like let's say a game of large numbers. So uh, we we deal a lot with statistics and um, like I would I would uh, compare it again to forensic anthropology, for example, when we can tell a, a lot of, uh, uh, from just one skeleton, just one individual. Here we usually don't have this individual, so we have to have uh, hundreds or even thousands of analyzed remains so we can talk about some themes such as the diet of uh, that community, community husbandry practices uh, and so on. So 
once we've excavated all the bones, uh, it's important to wash them. Uh, and they're basically washed just like human remains. So you shouldn't dip your animals into the water itself. They should be outside and with some brushes, you should just scrape off uh, the excess dirt um, from them with warmish, for example, uh, let's say it like that, warmish water. And also you should, in the once, if you're uh, washing the bones on the site itself, they shouldn't be dried uh, on direct sunlight because they can uh, they can break. So uh, the animal animal remains should be dried out in the shade uh, on some possibly if, if there is some wind. So basically outside. And finally, animal remote animal remains are uh, usually bagged according to the context they're excavated. So if you're excavating one pit, for example, or one layer or a grave, for example, then the context on the, all the animals, only all the animal remains that come from the same context for the, from the same pit should be um, should be bagged collect collectively and should be analyzed also collectively. And so when we come to primary analysis, primary analysis is what we are calling all the stuff that we can uh, learn from animal uh, animal bones. Uh, in the laboratory, basically. So these uh, cover the uh, more different vari vari varieties, sorry, of information like toxin determination, agent sex determination, traces of toponomic changes, uh, traces of pathological changes, anthropogenic traces, and biometric data. Uh, and also, unlike forensic anthropology, when we, when where you're usually looking at the whole skeleton and analyzing the whole skeleton, we take every element and every bone as one basically uh, uh let's say sample so we uh we have a formula not formula but like a access or excel table where we put information for every single bone and we try to get as much as information uh, as much information as possible from one single uh, single bone so all of these elements, all of these uh, uh, information, we're hoping to get from every single bone. Obviously, this isn't the case because they're either broken or you can't actually determine, uh, determine everything from every single one, but that's uh, our idea or our main goal. Uh, so the, to talk about the practical elements of, the, of this primary analysis uh, would take uh, much time and uh, which which basically can I it can be done in forty five minutes. Uh, we'll talk more about it in the course that uh, Natasha Natasha already talked about. Uh, and here I I just decided to show you what we what information or why we are basically doing uh, all of those segments from the primary analysis. This is just one uh, one small illustration to show you how we determine different species. So. Obviously, different animals have different uh, uh, different looking bones. Let's say it like that. So the morphology of the bones is different depending on the mammal, depending on the whether it's a, a mammal, whether it's a reptile, whether it's a fish, um, and so on. So uh, unlike Natasha, who only has who only needs to know uh, 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 bones from the one from human, basically, which all look the same, we have to. We have to know what different bones from like 20 animals uh, look like. Obviously, you can't uh, know all of that uh, uh, in every single time, basically. So what we have what we have to do is we get aided or we have help from different uh, uh, different sources. So, for example, if we take one femur from this image and we can't determine it by heart, we don't really know what animal it comes from. Uh, we can look into our comparative collection, which is basically a collection of either uh, archaeological remains that were well preserved. So we put them aside and we knew exactly what animal they come from. Or we make comparative collections from like modern animals uh, uh, that we basically uh, then uh, just uh, uh, determine. Uh, or you can have uh, we you can have a look into different atlases of animal bones, for example, the Schmidt Atlas, which is probably the most famous and the most common one, where you have uh, really good images of uh, the same bones from different animals, and you just uh, have a look to see uh, uh, which one is most similar to your specimens. 
So why do we do taxon and element determination? This is the most important probably part and the first part that, that is crucial to understanding the economy in the past. Uh, so once we have looked uh, into every bone and determined all of them, then we can talk about, uh, we can look, uh, only then can we look at them as a group and see what was the most important, for example, animal in the economy of the uh, of the site, what animals uh, were there in the site, do they have, um, what animals, for example, what wild animals play the role uh, uh, in that community, etc. And we usually put uh, uh, some graphs uh, that look like this to, to show uh, the economy or the diet at one settlement. Um, we also try to understand the age and sex, that we try to determine the age and sex uh, of animals, so we can also talk about the economy. Uh, this is one example from one important uh, uh, article written by Payne in 1973 that shows different uh, varieties of uh, age structure of uh, animals that represent, for example, if the economy was mostly oriented towards meat production or milk production or, for example, wool production, if we're talking about sheep remains, uh, and when we uh, determine the age of our animals, then we can look uh, which uh, which part of this was the most uh, most important in the economy of the settlement we are uh, actually analyzing to see whether those animals were mainly used for secondary pro products or for primary products, which is basically uh, meat. When we talk about traces of taphonomic changes, uh, those are the indication to us of um, what the animal bones, uh, for example, went through after being disposed. So everything that goes on with them after they're being thrown away, for example, in the garbage, uh, we are calling traces of taphonomic changes. So uh, most commonly, these are, for example, gnawing marks or bite marks from uh, different animals, for example, dogs or some rodents, for example. Uh, which tells us that those animal re remains weren't, uh, there wasn't like a, a pit that they were thrown and just uh, uh, covered with earth, but they were actually available to the animals. So they were actually scattered around the surface of the site. Uh, also, we can have uh, uh, traces of tapano uh, traces of fire, basically, which can indicate either that the uh, those uh, those trash places were garbage places were burnt at some point or that those animals were a part of some uh, for example rituals now all of this uh, depends on the context of, of the finding whether it was some sort of a cremation site cremation burials for example or just uh, just some uh, part of the settlement we can also have traces of pathological changes which uh, are indications to us of how the animals were treated in the past uh, or what roles did they have uh, in a certain community. So if you have these, these sort of uh, uh, traces on, for example, cattle uh, phalanges, cattle like uh, uh, lower parts of the cattle legs, uh, these exostoses. So we can talk about that the, the animals had, let's call it a, a rougher life that during their lifetime, they're used to carry uh, quite heavy weights for a uh, vast amount of time. And uh, so uh, because of that high pressure, there were these changes in the animal remains. But we can also talk about how some of the animals were treated by the human remain by the humans. Uh, so if we have, for example, some dog bones or dog skeletons that have, for example, uh, broken limbs, uh, limbs, broken uh, legs, or broken ribs that are healed, for example, or we have dog skeletons again uh, uh, that have no teeth, for example, all of the teeth have fallen out, fallen out, and those animals lived. We know that um, humans took care, took care uh, for them and nurtured them, and so on. Uh, also, there are anthropogenic traces, which are basically. Uh, traces that are made during the either killing of the animal or basically uh, all of the traces made by the human hand. So these can be made by cutting the animal, but uh, making it into small portions, uh, by um, curing the animal in terms of uh, making some smoked, for example, ham or whatever, by skinning the animal, uh, 
uh, or also anthropological traces um, are, are are all always found on some uh, objects that were made from animal bones, such as buttons or different needles or or uh, something like that. And also, uh, we can then look into some uh, reliefs or mosaics or whatever to see whether those uh, those cuts on the animal remains look somewhat similar to the representation that we have from historic different historic sources to see how they treated the animal carcasses and how the whether it was professional butcheries for example or not um, and there is biometric data uh, it can be when we try to measure all of the bones that are um, that are whole so all of the whole bones are usually being measured uh, they can tell uh, a difference between wild animals and domestic animals because during the process of domestication uh, most of the animals get smaller basically so the difference between uh, wild pigs and uh, domestic pigs can be evident with uh, uh, measuring the bones but also we have some indications of the for example, uh, uh, nurturing of the animals or feeding the animals uh, uh, during the larger periods of the past. So here on the right side, there is a, one histogram showing how uh, animal remains, cattle remains from the early uh, and late Roman period uh, are actually pretty, pretty larger, evidently larger than uh, both uh, cattle remains from the late Iron Age as well as the uh, early Anglo-Saxon age. So we can, by looking into this biometric data, uh, we can see how those animals were actually coped by, uh, coped with, and how they were basically, I'm going to use the term enhanced, for example, to for whatever need, whether it was more meat or stronger animals for, uh, for example, uh, doing more work. So this was basically the primary analysis and all of this is in our laboratory uh, at least being done into one uh, access base that we have and basically uh, it's obviously everything is obviously on Serbian but we have the context information and then the information all of the information about uh, the one bone and once you've done with that you just go to the next and it's all saved uh, so you can you can uh, look at it as a grouping uh, afterwards. Uh, and what is really important for me to say is that uh, what we're trying to, to do here with all of the archaeology, basically not just the animal remains, is we're trying to understand how life was in the past at a certain point uh, uh, geographically and temporarily, basically, uh, temporarily. Uh, so we have some live animals or some life assemblage that we're trying to understand or to guess. Uh, first of all, not all of the animals that once used to live uh, at the said area end up dying on the site. Some of them, uh, for example, wild animals, some of them, many of them died in the woods somewhere and aren't actually located in the settlement itself. Uh, again, only a fragment or smaller portion of the animals that did die uh, in the settlement were actually buried um, uh, buried in some like garbage pits or or similar stuff uh, in order to be preserved for archaeologists. Later on, uh, we have different post deposition process. So we have, for example, the acidity of the of the ground in some areas. We have different, uh, for example, roots that can uh, uh, destroy the bones. We can we have different animals such as moles uh, that can also destroy some bones. So since the period of uh, the deposition of the bones up until the uh, excavation, uh, a lot of the animal remains actually don't, uh, don't survive for the archaeologists. Also, when we excavate the site, uh, most often we do not excavate the whole site. So it's just a portion of the site that's being excavated, and therefore we can't really find all of the animal remains that are buried under it. So we're just... Uh, uh, getting a small a small portion of the animal remains that did survive. Then we get to the analysis, and when we're determining the the for example animal species, uh, at least fifty percent or even even a larger a larger number of the bones um, can't be determined 
because it's uh, uh, fragmented basically up to the point where you can't say what species or what bone it is. So uh, not everything that we did excavate can be analyzed actually or can be determined. So uh, in the end, we have to make uh, conclusions about this large life assemblage that was uh, once at a certain a certain uh, area. We have to make conclusions based on those uh, that small data that we uh, managed to collect. That's really important to know uh, for basically all of the material in archaeology, not just the animal remains, because we are, as, as archaeologists tend to uh, tend, to, we like to basically dream around and to try to make some narratives that are um, that are uh, unique or whatever. Uh, but it's not usually it's not possible. So we can have only small conclusions about. Uh, which we are certain and once again uh, i would say that looking at the whole picture or the whole context is pretty important so when we have archaeology or archaeozoology animal remains we're looking at one part of uh, life on on those settlements basically we're looking just at one uh, one small fragment of uh, uh, life and so we have to both communicate and uh, uh, with other archaeologists, the ones dealing with uh, human remains, the ones dealing with ceramics, the ones dealing with, I don't know, soil, uh, 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 plant remains, uh, to understand the whole picture of the site. So instead of just uh, being there to provide some uh, interesting statistics about whether there was 60% of 50% of cattle remains, uh, we should be taken into account when uh, dealing with the whole context of the whole uh, of the whole site. Uh, so now I'm going. I'm just going to give you uh, two examples of how archaeology works. Uh, first, we're going to go to South Serbia uh, to a, a town called Bela Palanka, where there is a, a ro late Roman uh, period site uh, called Remesiana. Uh, which was actually a early, late Roman, early Christian necropolis. The graves were, as you can see on those uh, images, some of them uh, had like uh, 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 were made of stone, and uh, then there was many graves that were just located, scattered all around those stone ones. And uh, one day we were just uh, digging, and uh, in the layer that uh, was the layer of the uh, where like the late Roman layer where they actually like uh, walked basically uh, we found this interesting uh, conglomeration of different different materials so there was uh, stone that there were animal remains there were ceramic uh, remains there were metal remains that were all just thrown together and we didn't really know what this was and they were also uh, they looked like basically elliptical. Uh, we didn't know what it actually meant, but we decided to, uh, you know, uh, write about it, to document it the best we could and just continue to dig. Uh, when Once we did the uh, animal remains, uh, uh, animal remain analysis, we saw that there is, uh, uh, there were only 32 animal remains. Most of them were uh, coming from uh, sheep or goat remains. And then we had pig and so on you can see by the by the silhouettes and the images and most of them had uh cut marks so we can say that they were processed by humans that they uh, used to be uh, uh that they were probably these those animals were eaten probably or processed but they also had many of them had bite marks uh from the dogs which uh told us or pointed us to the uh, conclusion that those animal remains were actually uh, on top of something, on top of soil that they didn't, that they weren't uh, uh, dug into the ground. So we thought, okay, can can this be, can these be the remains of some ritual? So uh, we had, like I said, groupings of different sized rocks, brick fragments, ceramic bowl fragments, animal remains, metal objects, so fragmented uh, knife, iron plating, and when we uh, uh, when we continue digging. For the next, for example, 20 centimeters, there was a hard layer of ash. So there was some burning 
um, uh, on that point, on that mark, before those animal remains were thrown away. And the most important part was that when we continued digging, some 80 centimeters below this surface was actually a burial, uh, and the only, the most atypical burial, burial on the whole necropolis, uh, which was a, a woman in her uh, um, 20s, uh, that was actually, it was a prone burial. So she was thrown uh, onto her face. She wasn't, she wasn't laid on the back, but was actually uh, um, on her face. Uh, so we uh, understood that this, uh, uh, these remains were actually a part of some ritual that took place just after the this this woman was actually buried. Uh, we're not. This is the only case uh, uh, that we have in 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 both those this necropolis and Serbia in general. So we're not really sure. Uh, we're just starting to to look into it in greater detail. But I just wanted to show you how. Uh, animal remains can aid into understanding a larger context. Uh, if we just took them out and analyzed them, it would be some some animal remains that were on, on the you know uh, like burial ground. But here we can understand that they were all a part of a singular event, probably that took place there. Uh, nowadays, interdisciplinarity is uh, pretty important in both archaeology and archaeology. Uh, we have different uh, physical chemical analysis, most most importantly stable isotope analysis uh, or ancient DNA analysis, but also for example some uh, lipid residue analysis where we can uh, it's not it's not done on animal remains. so we're uh, we're analyzing, for example, uh, the walls of the ceramic ceramic vessels to see whether they had uh, milk in them, for example. And just to show you another example of how these, uh, modern trends are implemented into uh, archaeology. I'm quickly going to talk about the project that I'm working on currently alongside my, my colleagues from the laboratory. Uh, it's called Archaeo Wild. And the longer name is the Holocene History of Human Wildlife Conflict and Coexistence, Archaeological, Archaeobotanical, Isotopic, Ancient DNA, Iconographic, and Written Evidence from the Central uh, box. I'm obligated to say that uh, it was it is funded by the Science Fund of the Republic of Serbia, and the grant number is seven seven five zero two six five. We just started this uh, uh, last year, actually, and it's going to last until the January twenty twenty five. So what we are trying to do is we understood that um, biodiversity loss and wildlife loss is one of the most important issues. Uh, of our modern societies everywhere around the world, uh, as well as in the Central Balkans, obviously. Uh, so we try to see how archaeology can be uh, can aid to this uh, to this issue. So what we uh, understood that we can provide is uh, one of our main goals is to uh, reconstruct the spatial and uh, temporal distribution of wild mammals in the Holocene of the Central Balkans. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to collect all of the wild animal uh, remains data that we can find both in literature uh, as well as uh, through our like uh, um, acquaintances with our colleagues that didn't publish their results yet. So we're trying to make a database and uh, map different animal remains uh, distribution from different periods uh, on the Central Balkans. This will give us the unique uh, basically results of having uh, so for example if uh, uh, one species is extinct in or nearly extinct in uh, for example Serbia once we have this kind of uh, data uh, modern con conservation biologists can uh, look in into it and see which areas of uh, central Balkans those animals used to live in so they can basically reintroduce them hopefully uh, uh, have a better understanding of where they can introduce them. Uh, we'll also try to reconstruct the extinction dynamics of large mammals in the Holocene of the Balkans, mainly Bosprim genius or the wild cattle, aurochs, and uh, European wild ass. The, both, both species are extinct, and when we're dealing with uh, extinction that we're dealing with today, we try, we'll try to understand how those animals were actually uh, what made them extinct, let's say. So was it just the 
for example, uh, was it uh, human activity or was it the combination of human activity and uh, weather uh, changes, climate change, uh, and so on. So we're going to date uh, as much as possible of the remains from uh, wild cattle and Ecoscidentinus to see when was uh, uh, when were they last actually alive into in this area. We'll also try to understand the nature of translocation and trade of ex uh, exotic species in the past. Uh, this is also an important, really important question today when we know that every now and then, like uh, on the customs, we have different exotic animals that are uh, being transported illegally. Uh, for example, in Serbia, we have leopard remains uh, in the Roman period site Viminatium in the context of the Roman amphitheater. Uh, and we will try to understand by using both isotopes and ancient DNA analysis to understand where it came from, uh, what paths uh, could it took uh, and uh, could it take, and to see actually how those uh, this trade of exotic animals actually uh, uh, worked in the past. We'll also try to reconstruct the paleoecology of the wild mammals. Uh, red deer and brown bear in the Central Balkans. So we'll uh, uh, do stable isotope analysis to see uh, whether there were some changes in the diet of these animals uh, during a large uh, large period of time. So we can maybe uh, talk, possibly talk about whether uh, human activity had any influence on their diet changes on the I don't know forest defloration or uh, stuff like that but also we're uh, uh, collecting information about the iconographic and literature representation of wild animals to see uh, what uh, uh, aspects or of life did they take uh, um, during different different periods um, of time uh, and like Natasha said, uh, uh, again, I will just uh, briefly uh, point you to the uh, course that is actually going to happen uh, on, in by the end mid to mid April. Basically, it will be a five day course uh, called Introduction to Archaeology Theory and Practice, uh, which I will be holding with uh, two of my colleagues from the laboratory, where we will basically uh, talk about a lot of stuff that I talked today, but in much much greater. Uh, greater detail, obviously, and we will uh, mainly focus on the uh, primary analysis, on the aspects of primary analysis. So that's it for me. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, please feel free to ask anything, and you have my email if you want to contact me for whatever reason later on. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dimitria. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Any questions? Now is the moment. Yes, hi, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> uh, hi, I have a question. Uh, so I'm an anthropologist, I'm a social anthropologist. Uh, I know. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but I do have a question about a context that is archaeological. Uh, so you were saying that usually uh, if it's a horizontal layer, the animal bones will be scattered. So if they're not scattered, if we are dealing with a whole skeleton or a large chunk, for example, half a horse, my, my example is half a horse. Uh, so that means that this skeleton, that this animal was interred. It was buried uh, and not left out. Or is there a way for like half a horse to stay whole without without like being being scattered around not necessarily so uh when it comes to uh, to whole skeletons uh, they if they were uh buried you can see like the the pit uh, uh basically uh, how, how how can i put this uh, you can see whether the earth around them was dug or not so whether it is a pit or, or not if they were laid uh, just on the surface like it was the example that i showed the camel from Viminatium, there is a possibility of uh for example dogs scattering some of the bones around that also depends on uh what 
moment of uh, decomposition they were actually left. So if the uh, if there was still a lot of meat around, it it was um, soon after the death of the animal. Then uh, it there is less chance of the bones being scattered. If it's later on in the composition, then uh, so the bones can be uh, more easily basically. Um, taken apart from the mm -hmm. joints or whatever. Uh, like it was the case with the camel, uh, the most part of it was uh, whole, but uh, its legs were actually a couple of meters away and were uh, pointing to the opposite direction. So, uh, and they were anatomically like uh, uh, correct, but in different direction, which shows mm -hmm. us that they were probably ripped right. out as the whole leg and then just taken off. So, uh, if it's a, a half of the skeleton, it probably was the whole one. Uh, now, I don't know what, what site we're talking about, but depending on the excavation, depending on the uh, uh, post-deposition process uh, after it was uh, uh, basically covered with dirt, uh, it can be scattered around. It doesn't mean that it can actually not just scattered around, they can disappear depending on the... Uh, they can just turn to to dust, basically, depending on the quality of the soil and and the, uh, for example whether it has some water running around uh, and things like that. But uh, when we have parts of the animals, we usually tend to uh, think that it was once a whole skeleton. Uh, but we again don't call don't we just uh, uh, analyze it as a part of the skeleton, but we probably assume that it was left as a whole. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question, if nobody else. Uh, uh, so I was just thinking, because there is uh, this huge problem with uh, taphonomy, as always, no? But in your context, it's maybe even harder because it's uh, you have in part of human diets is also including small bones, such as fish and uh, and chicken. So I, I can assume that in every excavation, you will have mostly big animals that are preserved, which doesn't mean necessarily that these are the, the main part of their diets, but simply that taphonomically the, the cow will be better preserved than uh, than chicken, right? That is a pretty, pretty uh, important uh, methodological question that we are actually uh, dealing. Uh, I'm not... Uh, so, yeah, the, the short answer is yes. It's logical and it's more usual for larger bones to be, uh, to be better preserved. Uh, but it's just... Uh, how should I say that? It's a handicap that you're aware of. So mm -hmm. when you make your conclusions, you don't, you try not to uh, exclude that limitation. So mm -hmm. whenever you're looking at a site, you should be aware of, of that limitation as a possibility. Uh, but again, there are sites that show that when you try to excavate uh, with greater detail that you actually do find mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. smaller smaller remains scattered around. I but I was just thinking of one thing because you know I was uh, uh, I was my PhD was about nuns and uh, they were really good in writing everything so the monasteries in general so you have quite good detailed um, uh, like daily diet, diet of you know in most of monasteries they were really like writing everything so uh, this could be like good opportunity to check uh, for example in uh, if there's I don't know if anyone did that diet for for example just to know what is the percentage that you're losing actually that is not there so if you have like the complete is it something like that done ever uh, we we try to when we when we're do, dealing with historical uh, historical uh, uh, periods we try to do that but there are limitations on uh, you would have to find some uh, uh, sources that actually talk about the settlement in question uh, for example I'm I'm dealing with uh, a Roman auxiliary fort on the Danube. Uh, and I have different literary so sources from all around the empire talking about the procurement of animals to the Roman army, uh, to the diet of the Roman army, to like uh, what was usually eaten and, uh, for example, receipts or whatever. 
but it doesn't add up actually for example in my in my case i have much much more wild animals that should be expected if we just look uh, uh, into the into the uh, litter resources and also they're usually uh, not concerned about the whole community they're usually about some some uh, um, some like uh, layers in the hierarchy that are higher up so they're ta uh, talking about uh, like the leaders of the of the army for example what they ate and not about the soldiers themselves for example if we're talking about the Roman period uh, so you can't at least in my opinion, we can't really look at the at the sources uh, and try to like match the, the results of the archaeology with them. They can actually uh, be pretty pretty diverse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Did you have a, a question? Um, no. I, I, I see a question. Say something. Well, just my cat stepped over the computer. I hope this didn't cause something. No, no. No, no, <laughs> but I just saw that you typed something, so I thought maybe there is a question. Sorry. Uh, there are oh, two no, questions thanks. in the in the Everything's chat. Everything's clear. <laughs> uh, there are two questions in the chat about whether the course will be online. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, pro you can probably... It will be online and there will be recorded sessions that... Can be uh, watched during watch one month afterwards. Yeah yeah, 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 exactly. But you can you can talk to Natasha about that or visit the site to see the dates and everything. Thank you very much, Dimitria. Thank you. I, I'm actually not not uh, in Serbia, so I will have to get off my internet because I'm on my cell phone. I just wanted to uh, say thanks to to all of you coming to listen and. I'm leaving you in the uh, safe hands of Anna. <laughs> bye bye. 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 Nice afternoon. Bye. bye. Thanks. Should we move on to archaeobotany? Yeah. Let's, uh, let's, let's continue. Plans, I guess. Okay. Let's share my screen. Can you see it all? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's good. Okay, perfect. So hi everyone, it is a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I enjoyed uh, Dimitri's lecture quite, uh, quite much and I think it's very nice um, occasion to have archaeology and archaeobotany kind of combined uh, maybe in some later discussion as well or in some questions that uh, you will have afterwards. Um, so I'm Anna Smuk. Uh, I am doing a PhD in multiproxy archaeobotany at University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and uh, I'm happy to be part of um, bioarchaeological team uh, that Natasha formed. Uh, so here are we this evening. Let's start with plants. Basically, what is uh, archaeobotany at the first place? So archaeobotany is discipline that has been considered as one of three main components of bioarchaeology, and it's most simply defined as investigation of interrelationships between humans and plants for whatever purpose is manifested in the archaeological record. The word itself obviously contains two main components of the research, so archaeology and botany. Therefore, you could have either of these two backgrounds or something relatable to some of them in order to dive more into the archaeobotany and eventually maybe even decide to make it your specialization. So, for example, I'm having an archaeological uh, background when it comes to my bachelor studies, and then I did two masters in different universities on archaeobotanical topics which uh, fortunately led me to this very archaeobotanical PhD I am doing at the moment. So um, also just for example, some of my former and current supervisors are having backgrounds in archaeology, in botany, in biology, earth sciences, even agriculture in one case. So what is common for all of us is the fact that whatever direction you are coming from, you still need to learn about kind of the other side 
of this journey you are um, diving into. And in a way, that's what actually makes archaeobotany um, and specialization into this field very exciting and unique journey. So uh, just to mention the very, um, very common in archaeology as well, the interest for Asian plant remains um, has its origin in the early 19th century. Um, but uh, basically from the second half of the last century, archaeobotany is officially developed as a scientific discipline. So um, as an archaeobotanist, you can work on either macro or micro plant remains, or sometimes like in the case um, of the work I'm doing at the moment, you can have some of them combined, which um, I will maybe have opportunity to uh, talk more about later as well. Uh, basically, the most common and easiest proxy when it comes to extraction process itself are the macro remains, um, as you would expect, I guess. Um, and they will be focus of this presentation as we are um, quite limited uh, with the time as well. But I hope that um, in the future we will have also opportunity maybe to have some lectures uh, where we will dive more into the macro, micro, sorry, uh, micro plant remains as well. So um, just to, to briefly mention um, what macro remains actually are, when we say macro plant remains, we mean larger plant tissues that are usually visible also to the naked eye. And they are most commonly found in archeological records as fruits or seeds, or sometimes, for example, chaff of the cereals. Um, basically fruits and seeds are um, the type of plant macro remains that are uh, mostly investigated because uh, they are preserving uh, pretty well in most of the cases and um, they are quite easy to identify, of course, uh, when you are um, in the field a bit more and have some experience to do so. Then we have um, micro remains, of course, and uh, micro remains are consisted of pollen, which is a powdery substance produced by seed plants consisting of pollen grains. And then we have phytolids. Phytolids are rigid microscopic structures made of silica found in some plant tissues and persisting after the decay of the plant itself. Then starch grains are tiny structures made by most plants as product of photosynthesis. And essentially a starch grain is a well-packed storehouse of glucose sugar units. So, um, Let's just give some examples of um, how micro remains could be preserved and um, actually um, brought to us in archaeological record. For example, um, often plant tissues preserve by becoming charred, and uh, that can happen in a cooking accident. Then the food preparation may also result in the position of starch on grinding stones and in cooking pots, where it may be preserved in food crusts, for example then decay of or burning of plant tissues such as leaves, stems and fruits releases phytolids, which are um, to mention again, plant opal silica bodies. So inorganic structures into the site sediments. Um, then certain kinds of cooking techniques may also result in phytolid deposition in vessels or ovens. And uh, for example, in the process of creating gardens or fields, people cut down and weed out some plants and cultivate and encourage others. And basically these changes um, and the mixture of uh, pollen that's deposited over the landscape can be also visible through archeological record. So um, also vegetation management like clearance of the landscape by burning will also be visible through pollen records. and. Uh, pollen deposited and preserved in lake sediments, records uh, the history of human plant relationship on a local and more regional scales. So you can see that there are many ways um, to look into the micro remains as well. But um, as I said, um, I hope that we will have opportunity to talk about uh, these uh, some other time, because I think macro remains are um, in a way the basic when it comes to introducing the archaeobotany um, to you at the moment. So um, let's just um, compare very shortly um, also what are the ways to look into these different proxies and if you have them combined in your research, so um, how to deal with that. 
Um, basically, here we can see some of examples um, how we are comparing those proxies on a scale of the type of information they are giving us. I would say one should choose which proxy or proxies in plural to use based on the aims and research questions of the research itself. So there is no general rule or answer applicable to all research problems, of course. If possible, the combination of different proxies is always a good solution, as you have information coming from different sides and helping with overcoming some of the biases, as we just spoke with uh, Dimitrie as well. You always have, unfortunately, these problems and biases coming from different types of preservation potentials, different types of material. So that's also the case with different botanical proxies. They all come with certain packages of biases. And that's why I think when you have opportunity to use combination of two or three or more of them, that's actually ideal situation. But then, of course, you have more work to do in considering uh, what each of them brings and uh, we took uh, comparing them and aligning them at the same time um, in the most uh, relevant and reliable way. Then let's uh, go back to macro remains. Um, basically, we have um, several um, conditions uh, to find macro remains in. And I think um, in my experience so far, I was mostly working with charred macro remains, as you can see um, in one of the pictures here, for example. At the moment, I am working with waterlogged um, macro, macro remains coming from the Dutch lowlands. Um, that was um, also a very nice opportunity for me to, to experience as preservation really affects uh, the assemblage you are working on and the ways you will approach to your work as well. Um, so charred uh, or carbonized plant remains, so what, what are they? They are the most common type of, of archaeobotanical remains which could be found in archaeological sites, at least uh, through, through Europe. And that's actually where so far I had the opportunity to work. So that's um, where, um, where this comes from as well. They can survive that way through many years, remaining unchanged in their structure but at the other side, they can suffer easily mechanical damage. So that's something you need to bear in mind when you are doing the flotation, which we will see in a second as well. Um, there are other few things to be borne in mind while thinking about preservation and carbonization process of the plant remains. So first of all, organic material can be exposed to heat both accidentally or on purpose while cooking or getting rid of the waste, for example. Secondly, some parts of the plants will be easier to become completely destroyed by heat, for example, as lighter chaff and straw in cereals than the others, which is, as you can see, um, of course, the grains themselves. And not all weed species or wild species are having the same survival capability, so some will be burned out long before others. Temperature and time of burning are also important and should be considered whenever possible. Preservation issue is definitely something to be included in considering processing stages as well, um, as the lighter parts of the cereals usually connected to the first stages of processing will be first burned away. So another mode by which plant remains can be preserved is desiccation. I don't have a picture of desiccated plant remains um, as um, that's not something uh, I encountered so far. Um, but that's definitely um, as relevant as the other preservation uh, conditions to, to mention. So desiccated plants remains are rarer recovery, but uh, incredibly important source of archaeological information, since all types of plant remains can survive that way, even very delicate, delicate vegetative attributes such as leaves or flowers. Then um, we have plant remains that can also be preserved in the archaeological record when its soft organic tissues is completely replaced by inorganic minerals. So that's what you can see here. Basically, this occurs when plant remains absorb minerals present in the sediment or organic matter in which they are buried. So this mode of preservation by mineralization only occurs under specific depositional conditions, usually involving high presence of phosphates. 
So um, it is common to find mineralized plant remains, for example, um, in some middens and uh, latrine pits. Then we have, as I just mentioned, um, preservation of plant material occurring when it's deposited in permanently wet um, anoxic conditions because the absence of oxygen prohibits microbial activity. So basically um, you don't have uh, enough oxygen in the water or very wet areas. And that's why the bacteria are not uh, attacking um, organic uh, plant remains in this case, like seeds and fruits, for example so they can be preserved for a very long time. For example, project I'm working on is dealing with Mesolithic, Neolithic transition period, and we have very nicely preserved um, material when it comes to macro remains. I mean, we have even some very fragile leaf spines from some species that are very rare to encounter. So waterlogged material is also a very nice mode of preservation to work with when you are in such area that offers um, preservation like that. Um, and then the last one um, is how I call it slow decay. That's basically not an actual preservation mode, but I wanted to include it here as I came across some material from 15th century uh, context in northern Serbia where the seeds of, of Sorghum bicolor, so that's a um, species similar to what we would know uh, generally like millet. Um, they were not charred, they were not mineralized, obviously not waterlogged in northern Serbia either, um, but they were still kind of preserved. Um, so they were empty from the inside, so the seed did suffer decay process in a way, but not completely, which allowed us to find them and also to identify them. So just to uh, mention main phases of archaeobotanical research, of course, first of all, um, excavation. Uh, but not necessarily, as you will see. Um, sampling itself, of course, has to happen. Then extraction process, the analysis, the lab analysis itself, and then, of course, um, important part of everything, interpretation and writing. So um, let's uh, mention the sampling procedure. Basically, there are several stages of archaeobotanical um, research and of course uh, when it comes to sampling ideally archaeobotanists should be on site um, because um, all the experience and strategy decisions sampling strategies decisions um, that have to be made uh, made and depending on the research questions that um, archaeobotanist uh, has uh, him or herself as well but if that is not possible it is still very important to sample the site and archaeologists can do that efficiently as well i have no doubts it is not really too complex thing to do or too hard thing to do it is uh, not too also too time too much uh, time consuming so I, I really hope that it will be more common practice on archaeological excavations uh, in the future as well. So um, when we are talking about sampling, there are basically three main types. Um, you see systematic sampling, and that's um, what is uh, basically on, on these pictures. So we were doing that uh, in southern uh, Serbia, uh, medieval and uh, um, post-medieval site. Uh, basically, that involves taking samples at um, set intervals during the excavations, and I usually like to divide the area in equal squares and sample each layer in the middle of it, so the place of sampling remains the same through the vertical stratigraphy itself. Then you have this uh, so-called judgment sampling. Basically, that entails the sampling of only areas and features most likely to yield ancient plant remains, for example, um, a hearth or um, some midden or something, a pit, something like that. And then it is good also to sample randomly to have what we call a control samples, again, depending on a context you're working in. But ideally, um, like in the case of the proxies, uh, also when it comes to sampling, um, if you can have um, all three in a way that's something um, that would be maybe the best way to pursue. Then what I would also like to mention, because um, for me, when I came from um, Serbia, where I was used to this uh, site, uh, excavations, sampling, and then uh, processing the mostly charred plant remains, 
Then I moved to the Netherlands and I saw a completely different uh, setting when it comes to sampling, when, when it comes to preservation potential and how to approach it. So um, you also can sample the cores. In, um, in this case, you have the core um, which uh, consists of, se of several meters coming from the bottom of what is today Lake Iselmere in the Netherlands. But uh, this sequence you see here is actually uh, representing um, some uh, levy uh, landscape element, uh, which is basically coming from submerged river system uh, that existed uh, in Neolithic, Mesolithic, Neolithic uh, time. And then eventually it was drowned by the rise of the sea level um, at some point. So um, we sampled uh, these uh, cores, five of them in our project for uh, multiple proxies. So for phytolith analysis, pollen analysis, macro remains, um, also, we have uh, colleagues who are working on micromorphology, uh, who are investigating uh, geochemical properties as well. We will have some radiocarbon dates to see basically the time span we are in when it comes to these cores as well. So as you can see, um, core sampling is definitely, if you are in, um, in an area that offers um, something, uh, something like that, it's also a very nice way to approach the research also without uh, possibilities to actually excavate um, archaeological sites or broader landscape or whatever um, your research is about. Um, so after sampling, of course, you need to process those samples. And one way is to do the dry sieving, which is very simple. So just let the soil through the sieves. And then you have wet sieving. So you can see also um, on the picture, um, basically wet sieving is the same thing as dry sieving, just you're using the water. Um, and in this case, uh, you need to wet sieve because uh, we have waterlogged um, plant remains and uh, we have very wet samples. So you need to proceed, of course, uh, with the water. And then, um, of course, you have flotation as uh, Dimitri already kind of uh, introduced, um, but we will uh, hear, we will hear now a few more um, sentences about it as flotation is very important part for archaeobotanical research, especially in the areas um, like uh, Southeastern Europe where I was working prior to coming here. And flotation can be done in basically two ways which are main so by hand or by machine. Machine doesn't have to be any fancy um, thing. You can, you can be very creative. And I saw people on different archaeological sites making their own kind of machines. I mean, as long as it works, um, of course, uh, you can have many types of it. So this is a flotation with the machine uh, we had in uh, one Serbian site a few years ago. Um, basically, uh, this is very efficient uh, thing to have on site if possible, as you can process larger amounts of soil in shorter period. And uh, what you see here is the tower with pipes that pour water up and then um, there goes a sieve on the top of them. So the water pressure is breaking basically the soil and liberating the plant remains that float and then fall back into the finer sieve. The thing I really don't like about machine like this is the cleaning process, as you can see also on the picture. Um, it's definitely not something easy to do as uh, the soil that, uh, that has been lying there for a couple of days because you really cannot clean the machine every single day. That would just take too much time. Um, but then uh, soil in there is so compact, then you need to basically dig into it. And uh, yeah, that, that was not really my favorite part of uh, flotating uh, with the machine in this site. Which leads us to a more simple, um, very cheap kind of uh, extraction of plant remains, which is bucket or hand flotation. Uh, that's definitely something uh, you don't need to invest much uh, money into having the equipment to do so. So um, that's why I always say to our colleagues uh, who are 
doing excavations that you can always have uh, someone who, who would just sample and do the flotation and then you already have sample which is really not too big and you can just uh, store archaeobotanical samples till um, archaeobotanist is available to come and to process them further. So um, basically hand flotation is also something I like because um, differently from flotation with the machine, um, yes, it does take much more time. So that's the disadvantage of hand flotation. But at the other hand, um, as one of my supervisors uh, was always saying, you see your sample all the time in front of your eyes. And that's, of course, uh, something uh, very, very important to have whenever possible. So here I had um, a video uh, where I'm doing some hand flotation made a couple of years ago. Um, I guess maybe it's better to proceed with the presentation just for the case if we are running out of the time and then if we do have enough time, because it's about, I think, seven or eight minutes long, then we can come back and uh, see some more of it. So then um, we are coming to the lab analysis. Um, and here you see all these uh, pictures that are very similar. Um, and that's because uh, these are just uh, some places uh, with microscopes, basically, uh, where I was working on the plant uh, macro remains uh, in Serbia mostly. So there are four cities in Serbia I worked in. And then um, there was a lab in Sheffield, um, very dear lab to me still. And then, of course, um, we have a uh, now lab in Groningen. Uh, even, I think, um, even more dear place, because, of course, that's where I'm spending uh, my time at the moment. And then if you don't really have a workplace uh, where you could work on your plant macro remains, you can always improvise, as I did after I came back from my master's in Sheffield. And, of course, I didn't have a job at that moment and I was freelancing for a year or so. So I um, just made like my home mini lab in Belgrade. And uh, yeah, I still uh, like to see those pictures. It was very nice, a very simple one as you can see, but uh, it's very easy for you to just uh, compile the things you need and to start working. And I mean, even now when I have uh, one of the best labs, uh, I think in the world to work in, uh, now I still have my uh, mini home lab here in the apartment as well, just uh, because uh, sometimes I like, uh, if I have uh, enough time in my spare time, I like to just go through some samples. Of course, you are not required to do so, <laughs> but uh, if you do want to, to do something like that, it's uh, really not a big invest investment of your money and time to make some setting like this at uh, some other places as well. Even if you are in a field work, like on site, that's also very easy just to bring all the stuff you need to do actual lab analysis uh, on site with you as well. So um, when you are doing uh, lab analysis, as you could see uh, in previous slide, uh, you will just uh, do some more sieving. Basically, I like to divide, uh, if it is dry sample, so charred remains, I like to divide it in different fractions um, from five millime milli milliliter, sorry, millimeters um, or from two to 0 0.2, because that's making uh, your life easier, basically, when you are doing the sorting part because you will immediately see in the big fraction if you have some crop uh, remains like pulses or cereals. And then of course the wild species and some of the weeds will probably be in smaller fractions. So you will immediately have kind of overview of what you can expect in your sample as well. Then when it comes to identification, that's uh, definitely one of the most important and most challenging steps in archaeobotanical research. This is something archaeobotanists uh, keep learning about literally their whole life, as there are so many plant species, so it's impossible to ever know all of them. Of course, when you are working in certain area, you get impression after a while about the species you expect to come through. And uh, of course, that makes your life easier and more possible to learn. So in order to identify the assemblage you have in front of you, there are a few things to be borne in mind. 
First, preservation of the remains, of course, again, plays the key role for identification. In most of the cases, we, we are able to go um, with identification to the species level, sometimes even to the subspecies uh, with plant macro remains, which is ideal. But sometimes that could be done up to genus or even a family. Um, again, if you have like charred uh, assemblage, then if the temperature was so high or um, simply it was exposed to, to the fire uh, for a longer time, then maybe um, the seeds or fruits would uh, just lose their shape. So of course, then that makes your job uh, much harder to do. So basically to help your work, there are reference collections in archaeobotanical labs everywhere in the world, uh, which can consist of modern plant material and also archaeological plant material that has been identified with certainty. And then the botanical atlases, as this one in the picture, are also very helpful because it's easy to just turn the pages and see more species and more families and genuses at the same time. It's important to look in the right place from the sources that you expect to be able to apply to your research area. For example, I'm not sure how useful would this seed atlas of the Netherlands be in Amazonia, perhaps. Um, so that's something just uh, to, to bear in mind. And there are many sites uh, that you can go and check to and compare with uh, the material you have. So one of them is, of course, also our university site that you can also see in this slide. So as we see when it comes to the time scale, archaeobotany in the same way as archaeology is interested, of course, in all moments of human existence. However, with the Neolithic period, crop domestication and all the changes that follow these events, archaeobotanical research gets its main focus in a way. That was the moment when the relationship between man and the land became much more intense, dependent and inseparable. So after that point, the influence human had on the nature became more and more clear and traceable. From that moment, man started altering the landscape in the way that will change both the humankind and the nat natural world forever. So here we should mention the last, uh, I guess, uh, and the most important uh, stage of archaeobotanical research, and that's point of everything we have been doing so far. Um, that's, of course, the interpretation itself. Um, archaeobotanists needs to be aware of the literature which is relevant for the topic we are dealing with, um, and to be able to put the archaeobotany in also in wider context when it comes to archaeology, history, ecology, botany, etc. So that is why at the end of the day, it is not too important if your background is archeological, biological, botanical, there will always be some parts and knowledge gaps you need to fill in. And that's it. That's basically, again, what I really love about archeobotany in general. Of course, uh, there comes also the importance of having right people in your team and working with you uh, from various fields as well. Um, Every, everyone that can basically add to um, the subjects you are dealing with and to research questions uh, that struggle you um, at the moment. So basically uh, what we have uh, since domestication um, um, and basically to, to the present day in a way um, as well are of course at the first place uh, cereals and some most common cereals, uh, for example, in Europe, again, I'm talking about uh, Euro European continent simply because that's uh, where my experience comes from, which, of course, doesn't make it um, any more relevant from any other part of the world. Basically, um, some of the most common cereal species here are uh, broom corn millet, so um, rye as well, some oat, einkorn, emmer, uh, spelt, barley, some foxtail millet, and the category of bread wheat. Cereals are basically the edible seeds of, uh, of grasses family, and uh, they are one of the most important parts of the human diet. So they are providing us with a high level of energy, mainly th through carbohydrates in their grains. 
And there, basically, with the chaff being used for both human and animal diet for thousands of years. So it doesn't surprise that cereals are very often the most significant plant category in many archaeobotanical studies. Then, as you would expect, we have, of course, some pulses. And pulses uh, were also representing the important part of the human diet since prehistory till today. Um, actually, I was just cooking today some uh, pea stew, so yeah, the pulses are definitely still pretty relevant, I think, um, in, our, um, in our diet. They are, uh, of course, an important source of proteins, and with cereals, they make the most important starchy food and source of energy. Often finds of pulses are high amounts of their find and high amounts of their findings indicate that they were cultivated through time and space among those used for human and animal consumption. And in like um, the case of cereals, uh, which might help us uh, determining who was uh, fed by them actually through how clean the sample was of chaff itself and the straws. Um, as we know, the animals were not fed only by the grains, uh, by, but uh, with the chaff as well. Then the next uh, category, um, very um, interesting one, of course, uh, are the fruits. Um, and the fruits and nuts were widely used uh, through many time periods, and um, especially through medieval times, as we have uh, many sources um, talking about it. And of course, um, the, the, the material you're seeing in this slide is coming from medieval sites um, in Serbia as well. Uh, basically, the question that raises here is uh, many um, in many cases, if people gathered wild species as an addition to diet, or some of the species were actually deliberately grown, and if they were grown on purpose, um, that would be actually interesting to know um, if uh, they were grown on a small or lar larger scales. Uh, for necessities of one household or for larger production. So there are many questions, of course, you can deal with when it comes to fruits and nuts as well. Um, they are not appearing as often as other types of plants and cereals. Uh, but, uh, for example, the big flora of uh, Tantaxa um, that uh, I was using at some point showed that uh, fruits uh, did have a very important role. Uh, for example, in the some Balkan areas um, we were going through and uh, you could see, uh, especially um, as you can see also in the pictures, uh, samples of uh, wine grape uh, being widely found through many, uh, through many sites, especially from medieval period um, as well. Uh, here, just uh, one kind of uh, intermezzo, I guess. Um, very interesting finding from one medieval site in Serbia, uh, Branicevo. There, basically, um, they found in a very nice, uh, lux luxurious uh, pot, uh, a very clean uh, sample of uh, 35, if I remember well, uh, pits of uh, Prunus fructicosa, Mongolian cherry. So that's... Uh, kind of wild cherry that was uh, not found before anywhere in Serbia. And if I recall well, uh, in other neighboring countries either, especially um, in, in the medieval period. What uh, makes this finding uh, very interesting is also the way of preservation, because as you can see on the pictures, so this is uh, just a modern example of uh, what probably is uh, the same species compared to what we found in Vranicevo. But yeah, when it comes to preservation, you can see that, uh, so not only the pit was preserved, and here you can see the inside of the pit, um, but also the meat of the fruit itself was very well preserved, which also made my job of identifying it uh, pretty hard because you, you couldn't see the outer surface of the pit. And usually you would identify base, based on pit in case of fruits um, from the Prunus uh, genus. So um, eventually, uh, when with the help of Alexander Archaeobotanist from Museum of Vojvodina, when uh, we realized that uh, this is Mongolian cherry, then um, I, I could go to a um, site in Serbia where basically people told me that something very similar to what I described 
still grows. So um, I took some um, I took some material to basically compare it, and here you can see that uh, it's pretty similar from what we found in Branicevo. Um, but yeah, it was very interesting, for example, uh, to think about the potential use of this um, of this fruit in in this context. We found it because uh, it was in luxurious uh, pot. Um, and it was basically probably dried prior to chart pro charring process, because if it wasn't dry, then uh, the meat would probably fall off more easily. But because it is so well preserved, um, they must have dried it uh, prior to the accident that uh, left it uh, burned or charred, uh, however you would call it. So um, yeah, one of the ideas um, is that maybe they would use it um, for tea making, but to be honest, I'm still not uh, too happy with uh, that interpretation either. So that's something um, that still bothers me. Uh, so we published uh, the finding, but uh, of course, uh, as uh, it's the case in archeology, span very often, sometimes you will publish and you will uh, make your ideas about it clear, but uh, maybe in some later stages of your career and your research, um, you will actually realize that, that uh, you will have some better ideas on the way coming from all different um, contexts and uh, work you will do in the future. So that's what I'm hoping that will happen in this case. I guess uh, just the time will tell. Um, then uh, just to mention also briefly uh, some oil plants. Um, basically, they could serve for either oil or textile making, and they were usually representing a significant part of the settlements from prehistory onwards, and also in the Middle Ages, for example. So there are also many historical sources telling us about the use of flax and hemp during the medieval times in Europe. During the late Middle Age, for example, flax was one of the main materials for making the thin clothes as cotton is basically used today. And it was also source for making sheets, towels, the linen for the winter clothes, etc. The plant would be sown for its long fibers inside of the stem, which would serve as material for, for textile production. And basically both flax and, help, and hemp, as well as opium poppy, the third species present uh, in many data sets uh, through medieval sites, uh, for example, in the Balkans, uh, could have been used uh, for oil making. So um, that's um, also uh, something uh, very interesting to think about. Uh, what were the activities not related directly to the diet itself, but also uh, for producing other things such as textiles and all the uses textiles, of course, had um, in the past as it has today um, in human's life. And then um, we are coming to uh, the last but not the least part of um, archaeobotanical research considering plant macro remains. And those are, of course, the weeds and wild plants, uh, which can give us information um, of all sorts of uh, kinds. So they can give us information about human activities and also more natural landscape focused answers towards discovering how the area we investigate might have looked like, how suitable, for example, as the case in our project for the moment, uh, how suitable certain grounds were for different types of human activities, um, et cetera. So just to mention the one um, interesting fact uh, about the weeds, for example. So I always give the example of uh, corn cockle, uh, which is one of the most common weed species that can be found among cereal grains. It has very similar size uh, among the cereals and it is also simi similar weight as the cereals. So it is very hard to remove it from the crops during the processing stages. Usually it requires picking up uh, literally each uh, seed by hand. Um, and at least the fact that corn cockle seeds are black makes the job of removing a bit easier. So that's luckily, but uh, it can be very toxic um, if it is taken in certain amounts. Uh, basically, um, it can be bad for one's health and in bad case, it provokes headache, but it can also provoke more, sev more severe conditions um, as well. And uh, there is also 
very interesting story about uh, all these uh, witch hunts uh, in the medieval period. So here, for example, you see uh, Claviceps purpurea. So this is a fungi uh, which is called ergot. It usually grows on rye and in medieval times, um, it uh, must have been a reason for many uh, people going uh, mad in a way and uh, it caused directly and indirectly uh, probably many deaths uh, during that period as, uh, for example, people who would act, uh, well, kind of unusually would uh, probably be pursued uh, as witches uh, and in some cases, of course, convicted to death. But uh, at the same time, it is also toxic. So if it is consumed in certain amounts, it can also directly uh, provoke very severe uh, health problems and in some cases even deaths. Um, then you have um, here um, examples of uh, some wild species uh, we found in uh, this course that um, I showed you uh, from the lake um, uh, from the lake area in the Netherlands, um, the pre prehistoric material. And basically it is, as I mentioned, very well preserved waterlogged uh, plant uh, macro assemblage. Um, here, for example, you can see um, the leaf of peat moss, which was found in very uh, big amounts. And then um, you can see um, all the other um, examples uh, that are telling us basically that at the moment, uh, we can say that we are in a freshwater marsh vegetation. So that's the type of information, among others, you can also get from wild species. Basically, what is the type of environment uh, you are in with, uh, with your assemblage and uh, what the landscape might have looked like. So that is more natural um, way of going into discovering uh, this period uh, that's focus of your research. Um, as well. Um, so at the end, you can ask uh, why we should include archaeobotany in archaeological research. And I guess uh, the reasons are pretty obvious. Basically, it can give you really, as you can see also on the slide, uh, large sets of information. And to be honest, for me, coming from um, the background, uh, from the archaeobotanical background in Serbia, um, I was more focused, I guess, on economical aspects of investigating uh, the plant macro remains. But then uh, when I came here to Groningen, I discovered how um, the more landscape, environmental, nature-oriented um, set of research questions can also pop, uh, pop in. So archaeobotany really can offer you very broad um, ways of going into, into the things. Many research questions can be answered by different botanical proxies, uh, but that's basically a um, topic to make a presentation for itself. Um, and I really think and hope that um, in the future there will be many more people specializing in this field because uh, there already is uh, quite some number of people. I mean, even in the Balkans, the situation where I'm coming from, the situation is getting better and better um, with each uh, few years. And for example, I was uh, last year in um, this biggest archaeobotanical conference happening every three years in Czech Republic. And there I saw that there are really um, many archaeobotanists, many young people coming into the field, which is, of course, great news. But then also you have all these um, more experienced colleagues who are very helpful and very invested uh, into helping people who are just coming in. So, um, for example, everybody that I would email uh, on my way uh, towards the, making the decision where to do a PhD and what to do further when it comes to archaeobotanical uh, specialization, everybody were very helpful, whoever I approach. So I really do encourage um, all people who have any sorts of questions, even if you are not thinking to specialize, but you are just wanting to know more um, in the context, through the context you are in, I really encourage uh, all of you to always just send emails, ask questions, of course, um, to me as well. I will help with anything I can, anytime. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the direction I hope we will continue with. Um, yeah, just to, um, again, make a summary of uh, what archaeobotany kind of is. 
So it is a very exciting journey, a very challenging journey, but that again makes it even more exciting. Uh, it's a field where you will never stop learning. And it's something that uh, basically makes you uh, just motivated and uh, enthusiastic um, in every step along your way. So this is um, the project I'm working on for my PhD. Um, I will, I think we don't really have too much time, so I will not uh, tell um, too much about it. Um, you can read, uh, that's why I posted a link on this slide, so you can read more about it. And of course, you can always ask uh, any questions that you might have. Basically, what we are trying to do here is to find out how suitable the Dutch lowlands were in this Mesolithic, Neolithic transitional period for agricultural activities. And we are using a multi-proxy approach in order to discover that. So as I mentioned, we are working on several botanical proxies. We are also applying micromorphology. We are applying geochemical properties. We will have a very well radiocarbon dated um, layers we are working in. So we really hope that um, in three years, um, three, four years um, till the end of our project, we will be able to actually say um, how suitable uh, these wetlands uh, in the Netherlands were for agricultural uh, production. Here is some archaeobotanical literature if you would like to uh, just have a hint uh, about uh, what we talked. Um, this evening, but of course, you can always email me for something more or different directions you would like to go to. And uh, at the end, um, I am very glad to announce that uh, the IWGP conference that I just mentioned, the biggest archaeobotanical conference happening every three years, will happen next time in Groningen. Um, and we are organizing it. So University of Groningen with Cultural Heritage Agency in the Netherlands. Um, I hope that some of you or all of you will be able to come. Um, it's amazing uh, set of uh, people coming from all over the world doing not only archaeobotany, but also um, any other uh, fields that are um, encountering archaeobotany and uh, touching the research, same research questions in a way. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, it would be nice to finish the presentation with some Happy faces, looking forward to organizing it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Anna. It was lovely. I just need to stop share, I guess. Mm -hmm. Did I do it? Yeah, yeah, you did. So any questions for Anna? I have one. Yeah. What would you um, suggest to somebody who is interested in archaeobotany from where to start? Because it seems uh, from from my perspective, and also I, I had this pleasure to, to see lab that you were working here in Barcelona. It's, it seems like quite complicated because like, as uh, Dimitria said, like I have only hum one uh, or even that with humans is like, if we talk on non-adults, non it's hundreds of small bones, but then you have animal bones, which are even more. But at least as he said, like the, the uh, pig from Roman period and pig from um, Netherlands, like Netherlands or Balkans, it's similar or same. Mm -hmm. And then you have another problem because you have even more plants and they're different from uh, part to part. So it seems quite complicated, no? So where would one start? What, what would you suggest? That's actually a um, great observation and very good question. Uh, I mean, yeah, it does make uh, the field more challenging. And I guess that's why also less people are diving into it in a way, because it really requires um, a lot of commitment. Uh, but when you are in those waters, then uh, you see um, that it's just such an exciting journey because of those challenges as well. And I think that's why people are also in this field extremely motivated and helpful because everybody knows how hard it is to start. Um, but then, of course, so when you start, it gets easier with the time. So um, where one should start? I think that really depends on a context you're coming from at the first place. Um, and also what, uh, what kind of research you would like to do in your career in general. So I think first it would be important to 
figure out uh, maybe which proxy you would like to do and where in that manner you would like to specialize. So it doesn't have to be macro, macro remains. I mean, for me personally, macro remains are um, the most, uh, the easiest proxy uh, in a way to work with when it comes to botanical ones, but it doesn't have to be. So I had a colleague in Barcelona who started immediately with phytolids and she is thrilled with the research she is doing. So I think uh, first of all, maybe that would be a good way to start thinking about uh, where you are coming from and where you would like to go. It's I know it's very vague uh, answer, but also it's very difficult question, very good one. <laughs> but uh, I'm afraid not one that has um, kind of a universal res response that would be relevant in every situation. So I guess if uh, somebody is doubting if they might try it out or not, then uh, maybe it would be good for them to approach an archaeobotanist. Uh, again, I'm always uh, there to, to talk and to answer any doubts and questions. And then I think we could see where that person um, who is thinking about it is coming from, what are um, her or his interests. And uh, then I think uh, it would be maybe easier to form um, an actual response uh, to that question. How did you start? What was your, like, what was the moment when you fell in love? Well, uh, I was uh, lucky to um, go to one uh, excavations, which were very international in southern Serbia. And there I was helping out a colleague from Kiel, from Germany. She was doing uh, macro remains. So that's why basically I started with macro remains. And I think usually people start with this proxy simply because, um, as I mentioned, it's the easiest way to extract plant macro remains plant remains, sorry, and also it is uh, not that expensive to uh, get the right equipment to do so. So that's something you can really even um, do um, for yourself. I really didn't spend uh, a lot of money uh, basically getting everything I need so I can start as a freelancer at, at first. And now, of course, uh, luckily, I have um, all the opportunities that uh, lab itself offers. So that's why I think maybe macro remains are a good way to start with. Um, and also, of course, um, it's good to start from the macro uh, world, because then if you dive more into the micro uh, structures, I think that will make uh, your um, understanding, if you're coming from archaeological background, more comprehensive and understandable. But for example, if you are coming from uh, biological um, background or botanical background, then I can imagine that uh, even if you immediately start uh, working on phytolids or pollen, especially, that would not be as challenging for somebody coming from uh, background more of natural side than, for example, that uh, that is for me, um, who is um, still kind of in humanity based mm -hmm. uh, thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there any questions for Anna? Okay, if not, even if you're watching this later, you see we're all easily approachable, so you can uh, write us anytime or even, even in a few months if you just uh, make up your mind that you want to, to go more deeper into this, uh, yeah, you can contact any of them or me, I will be glad to, to help you. Absolutely. Okay, thank you so much, Anna. It was lovely, and uh, it's really nice to see you, even uh, like this and uh, online. Uh, have a lovely evening, and for all of you, enjoy uh, Saturday. And hopefully, we'll have a well, not hopefully, definitely, we'll have our next uh, lecture on paleoparasitology in uh, March. So take care. Nice. And see you soon. Bye. See you. Bye.